Hello, my name is Carol Howell and I'm with UC Davis Center for Healthy Aging and it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Mosqueda. Dr. Mosqueda is the Chief of Geriatrics at UC Irvine School of Medicine and she's a professor of family medicine and holds the Ronald W. Reagan Endowed Chair in Geriatrics. She sees patients at the UC Irvine Senior Health Center and participates in research and education as well. Welcome Dr. Mosqueda. Thanks, Carol. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about this very, very important issue of forensic markers of, of elder abuse. And I would like to just sort of give a warning that this is really primarily designed for professionals who work with older adults, people such as adult protective service workers, health care providers, social workers in the community, um, public health nurses, etc., people who work in healthcare care settings, because I am going to be showing some photographs that really could be disturbing. Um, and actually ought to be disturbing uh, to us um, and certainly unpleasant to see. So I just would like for people to know that ahead of time. We're going to be focusing on physical abuse and neglect over the next 20 minutes or so as we talk about the issue of elder abuse. It's such a broad topic that we're going we're gonna to zero in. Why is it I'm going to zero in on this? Well, as a physician who's done a lot of work in the area of elder abuse, has worked closely with people in healthcare professions, social service settings, et cetera, I'm tired of a few things. I'm tired of hearing, that's not abuse. He's just old and old people bruise easily. I'm tired of hearing this. That's not abuse. He's just old. Old people fracture easily. I'm tired of this. That's not abuse. He's just old. Old people fall. That's what happens. That's not abuse. He's just old. Old people get pressure sores. This is just what occurs. It's time for us to stop thinking in this way and to understand that while old age can bring illnesses that make people more likely to have bruises, pressure sores, and fractures, we also have to think about the unfortunate possibility that abuse may have occurred. Why is it so hard to tell if physical abuse has occurred? Why is it so hard to tell if neglect has occurred? Well, because there are normal age-related changes that occur. There are common age-related changes, and in a moment I'll help with that distinction. And I think it's especially important for us to pay attention to the context in which an injury occurred. So the challenge in older adults is we have these normal age-related changes, things that are expected, things that we should accept, uh, things such as white hair, um, wrinkles. These are all normal age-related changes um, that are not disease processes. Um, there are also multiple comorbid conditions that occur. These are some of the common age-related changes that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, so somebody, for example, might have Alzheimer's disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and trouble with their kidneys. And so you'll often see older adults who have multiple medical problems that coexist. Medication effects, of course, are a major issue with older adults. This can be anything from medicines that make it more likely that you're going to have a bleeding problem, medicines that can cause changes in thinking and memory as side effect problems, medicines that can make blood pressure drop precipitously so that older adults are more likely to take a fall, and of course cognitive impairments that become much more common as we grow older. After the age of 65, about 3 to 5 percent of people have a dementia, but after the age of 85, it's close to 50 percent. And this can also confuse the picture when we're trying to figure out what's going on in the world of elder abuse and neglect. Some of the normal and common changes that occur if we go through what I refer to as my organ recital for a moment, if we look at a few different organ systems, in the integument or the skin, our skin becomes thinner, our capillaries become more fragile, skin tears become more of an issue, bruising becomes more of an issue. In our sensory system, there's this entity called presbycusis, which is uh, hearing loss that occurs, a slower reaction time, perhaps more difficulty defending yourself if somebody is coming at you, um, problems with vision such as macular degeneration and cataracts. These are common age-related conditions, although they're not normal age-related conditions. In the kidney system, the renal system, there's a decrease in what's called the creatinine clearance. This is a measure of kidney function, and of course, one of the main roles of the kidney is to clear out the toxins that people like me prescribe to older adults, adults that is medications. 
In the musculoskeletal system, there's this entity called sarcopenia, which is a decrease in muscle mass. And I'm not saying that older adults are wimps. I've met plenty of amazing 80, 90-year-old centenarians who are playing tennis and hiking. Uh, but we do have a decrease overall in our muscle mass as we grow older. There's a decrease in bone density, and if that crosses a certain line, it actually goes into a disease condition called osteoporosis. And we also have functional changes that occur as we grow older. Uh, there can be problems with gait and balance. Uh, there are some people who are on what I refer to as the frequent faller program. So people who fall more easily as they get older, perhaps due to a combination of things. My hearing's a little bit down, my vision's a little bit down, I'm on a medicine that makes me dizzy, there are hazards in my environment, and you put all these things together and you're more likely to take a trip and fall. Issues related to driving, handling finances, of course, can become a problem as people grow older as well. Let's turn for just a moment to talk about the issue of dementia and abuse because I think this deserves its own special look, its own special category. So before we really get into why people with dementia are at higher risk of abuse, let's just remind ourselves what dementia means um, because it is a medical term that has a very specific de definition. So in order to say that somebody has dementia, you basically need three things. You need to know that they have some memory loss, which is usually short-term memory loss but they also have problems with some other area of their cognition, with some other area of their thinking. It might be problems with judgment, reasoning, insight, um, as we see particularly in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. It might be problems with language. And language is both expressive, being able to tell you what's going on or write down something, but language is also receptive. How well are they able to understand what it is that you're saying to them, what you might be asking them. So you have to have memory loss and loss of some other area of cognition, and these two things need to be severe enough so that they interfere with a person's daily function. So they can't do what they used to do. And now you can be really begin to understand why people with dementia are at high risk of abuse. Um, they might not be able to recognize abuse because if they have a particularly advanced dementia, I recently saw a woman who was in a very advanced stage, had very severe pressure sores, lying in feces and urine, and the only person that she still recognized was her caregiver, uh, you know, the person who really wasn't providing care, but her son. And she didn't understand that she was being abused and she was actually severely malnourished, had no way to contact anybody, was being kept in a very isolated sort of situation. Some people with early stages of dementia, illnesses such as Alzheimer's disease, are at very high risk of financial abuse. There are folks in the community who seem to have radar and knock on their doors and have them sign over uh, great amounts of money, sign over their house, get unnecessary repairs done on roofs, et cetera, because you have a person who really can't comprehend what it is they're signing anymore. And so older adults with demanding illnesses end up as real targets for abuse. As people get into more moderate stages of a dementia, this is where I'm seeing a very high risk of physical abuse. Let's be honest about it. People with a demanding illness can be really annoying to be around. They can be very difficult. They might be following the caregiver around, asking the same question over and over again. Uh, they're repeating themselves. They don't understand where they are and require orientation. And so sometimes caregivers just can't take it anymore. The caregiver might also have problems such as alcoholism or mental health problems. And now on top of it, they're trying to deal with somebody who's requiring a high degree of attention and they will finally end up hitting the person. Sometimes the caregivers are really bad folks who are just beating somebody out of the power and control dynamics that we commonly see in domestic violence situations. What really worries me though sometimes is that people with dementia who tell us, who tell a healthcare provider, who tell a social worker that they've been abused are discounted and not believed because they have a dementia. We're just doing a study on this right now to look at whether or not people with dementia are able to remember emotional memories because our observation has been that even though a person with dementia might not be able to tell you the specifics of exactly what occurred in the situation, they will remember the emotional parts of it. They'll remember how fearful they were. They'll remember that they were terrified. They'll remember that they are scared of this person even though they cannot tell you exactly what happened. And I think it is incumbent upon us to really pay attention to that 
and document this carefully so that we're able to intervene on their behalf. People who are demented might not know that they're even being abused. They might be so demented, so confused, that they don't even understand that they're being abused. They may have some recognition that something is wrong, but are unable to know how to use the telephone, unable to report abuse. They're being kept isolated and away from people. And one thing that really worries me, particularly for those of us in health professions, is that somebody with a dementia might say that there's a problem and we don't believe them because they have Alzheimer's disease. So we always need to take it seriously when somebody tells us they have a concern. So put this together and it means that people who have a dementia such as Alzheimer's disease are especially vulnerable to being abused. What are some clues that abuse may have occurred? Well, during your history and interview, you wanna pay attention to some of these kinds of issues. Does the explanation make sense? Is it plausible that this has really occurred? Is it so vague that you can't even understand what they're telling you has occurred? Was there a delay in seeking care? So by the time somebody comes in to see you, they have a stage four pressure sore. And we'll go over the stages of pressure sores in just a moment to remind you what they are, but that's a deep pressure sore. What was going on when it was a stage one or a stage two or a stage three? Why weren't they seeking care at an earlier time? Are there unexplained injuries that you find on exam? Maybe some of the injuries maybe might be old, um, or they might be current injuries that were never reported. What does the interaction look like between the patient and the caregiver? Are they arguing? Do you notice that the patient is reacting in a fearful manner whenever the caregiver is around? Do you notice that the caregiver is yelling or belittling at the patient that you have who's right in front of you? Pay attention to this during an interview. What about clues on the physical exam? Are you finding open sores, bruises, other wounds that make you concerned? Does the person have an unkempt, sort of dirty appearance? Um, is their hygiene very poor? Whenever I have the least little bit concern, I always take off shoes and socks. Uh, sometimes people will get a bit cleaned up to come into the office to see you or if they know you're going to the home, but they usually don't think you're gonna look at their feet. And sometimes you'll take off shoes and socks and find very elongated, dirty nails that will clue you in to the fact that there really is a problem. Look for evidence of malnutrition. Does it look like there's a lot of muscle wasting? Evidence of dehydration? Is their mouth really dry? Does it seem like they're very thirsty? You want to see if the story matches the physical findings. So now you've, you've looked at the person and you might see some sorts of, of injuries. Does it make sense? And this is where we talk about context. And I'm going to go over a few slides with you for a minute. So let's look at this person's legs and see that on what we call the anterior, the front part of, of their lower leg, we see these bruises. Does this make us concerned about abuse? Not particularly, this is a pretty common place to, to, to bump yourself. And so I wouldn't say this would raise a very high suspicion for me. Um, I might ask a question, but I don't think that this would raise a high suspicion for me. But when somebody comes into my office, as this person does, and I see bruises up and down the middle part of the thigh and, and leg, lower leg, you better believe I'm gonna ask some questions about how this occurred. This could be evidence of a sexual assault it could be evidence of somebody who is hitting or beating this person, um, and you have to ask the question. You then need to see if the history makes sense. And I'll tell you what the real life history was behind this particular case. I saw this, the person didn't even tell me that she had bruising, her dress was down, and I saw the hint of a bruise on her, on her inner lower leg, and said, what's going on? She pulled up her dress and showed me all this bruising, and actually gave me the following story, that she was in her bathtub, she was getting out, she slipped, and she actually slid along the lip of the bathtub and just hit her in her thigh. I asked her if anybody was hurting her. She said, absolutely not. I believed her, I didn't make a report. And, but I, my point is, I did ask the question because this is a highly suspicious area for bruising. This is not a place where you are going to commonly bump yourself when this sort of bruise occurs. Here's an example of some bruising, wounds, uh, discoloration on the bottom of a person's foot. And you can also see that their nails are elongated. This occurred in a person who has an advanced dementia. And the story we were given is that this person must have stepped on something, we're not sure what, and that's what caused this. But this is a case where the history 
that they gave us did not fit the physical findings because this person was barely ambulatory. They're barely able to get up and move on their own. So it's completely implausible for me to believe the story that the caregiver was giving us. And this, in my book, is suspicion until proven otherwise and deserves a thorough evaluation. Here's another example of a woman who was unable to tell us what occurred because she does have an advanced dementia and they said she must have grabbed something hot and that this is why it occurred. Well, she also on exam has contractures at her elbows and the idea that she was going to be able to reach for something and grab something hot was an implausible explanation that didn't make any sense to those of us who were looking at this. And again, abuse until proven otherwise. This is an example of somebody who has severe burns on their buttocks. The story we got was that the person, were, you know, we feel horrible about it, but they got into a really hot bathtub when we weren't looking. Now, if that's the case, you would also expect this person to have burns on their feet, ankles, and other areas, not just on their buttocks, which they didn't have. So again, this is an example of a physical exam not fitting the history that we're given and that we need to have an extra dose of suspicion and look into it to protect these folks. I want to turn our attention to a minute, um, for a minute to the issue of pressure sores. Um, I believe absolutely that pressure sores can occur despite good care. I do not believe that every pressure sore is a sign of neglect or, or abuse. But I think there are some pressure sores that really get me worried. Some worrisome signs are sores that aren't being treated um, people know about them and they're just not doing anything about them. Nobody's notified the health care provider. No attempt has been made to um, notify a health care provider and do something about it, ask for somebody to come to the home. The sores are sometimes very smelly and dirty. I've seen sores that have maggots in them. I've seen sores that are covered in feces. And I find this totally unacceptable. And the other worrisome sign is a pressure sore that's very deep, again, that nobody has, has attended to in any sort of reasonable way. Let's remind ourselves what the different stages of pressure sores are. These are stages one through four. In stage one, you have intact skin, but you might have a blister or what we call non-blanching erythema. You'll have redness on the skin, um, and you'll see that the skin looks a little bit angry and inflamed. In a stage two pressure sore, we now have had some erosion through that top layer of skin into what we call the dermis. So it's gone past the outer layer of the epidermis and into the next layer called the dermis. In a stage three pressure sore, we now have further penetration so that the, not only is the epidermis and the dermis broken through, but you're now into the adipose tissue uh, or the fat tissue. And finally, in a stage four pressure sore, you're down to muscle, tendon, or bone. We need to remember, of course, as horrible as a stage four pressure sore sounds, in some older adults who are very, very thin, uh, for example, on, in their buttock area, if they're quite thin, the distance to go from a stage one to a stage four might be a matter of a centimeter. Uh, whereas in somebody like me, it's a much greater thickness. So we need to take into account what's going on with that individual person uh, when we're looking at these different stages. So when somebody says, well, they have a stage four pressure sore, is that abuse? The answer is, I don't know. We really have to start understanding the context. And we'll talk more about context in just a moment. We need to turn our attention now to the issue of laboratory findings that occur in abuse. And I, and I list this as both direct and indirect laboratory findings. We can do chemistry panels and look for evidence of malnutrition and dehydration so that if I'm called by the police or an adult protective service worker and we're trying to figure out whether or not this person was, say, dehydrated, they're now in the hospital, I need to make sure that I'm looking at laboratory data that were obtained before the person received things like IV hydration. So we have to be very careful about when we're interpreting the laboratory data in relation to what sort of medical care the person has received. We wanna look for electrolyte imbalances that might tell us that this person, again, is not being nourished properly. We wanna look for impaired kidney function that, again, might point toward issues like dehydration or it might help us understand why they have toxic levels of certain medicines in their bloodstream. We can look at a blood count called a CBC and look for evidence of severe malnutrition and anemia. And finally, we can look at medication levels. So 
One of the common medicines that older adults is on, are on is called digoxin or lenoxin. And you can measure blood levels of that medication to see if they're getting toxic, if they actually have become toxic on it and are receiving very, very high amounts of this medicine. Then you have to figure out if that was done improperly or if it was really done because of innocent sorts of reasons. Let's now talk about this context word that I use quite a bit because I believe it is often the key to understanding whether or not physical abuse or neglect has occurred. All right, all bruises, they're due to the same thing. If you rupture a blood vessel and you have blood that extravasates into the tissue, you get a bruise. All pressure sores are due to the same thing. Um, it's due to, the reason it's due to pressure is that you don't have an adequate blood supply. You say have too much pressure on the outer part of the skin, so you're not getting oxygen and good nutrients to that area of the skin. And after enough time, that tissue actually dies and you end up with a pressure sore because you're not perfusing the tissue. All fractures are due to the same thing, right? If you have an external force that's greater than the strength of bone, the bone breaks. So just looking at a fracture by itself or just looking at a pressure sore by itself doesn't really tell us whether or not there was abuse involved. We have to figure out why these things occurred. Why is it they have a pressure sore? Why is it they have a fracture? And understanding the context is really the key to making a determination. Now I will tell you that sometimes, I don't care what the context is, we'll see somebody who clearly has been abused. They have massive pressure sores that are dirty. They have obviously been beaten and then you can make very definitive statements. But I think the challenge many times for folks like us is that it's not as clear cut and we need to look a little bit further. We wanna be cautious. We don't wanna accuse people unfairly. The reality is that older adults do bruise, do bruise easily. And we don't wanna go around accusing people because that of course has a huge impact on a lot of people's lives. On the other hand, if you have somebody who's quite vulnerable, you don't wanna miss an abusive situation. What we've seen time and time again is that many of the folks, by the time we're involved looking at abuse, the abuse has been going on for years. We have to ask the right questions and we have to listen with a critical ear. Does this story match what we're finding on our physical exam? So I invite you to visit our website, our Center of Excellence on Elder Abuse and Neglect, where we have some more information that people we hope can utilize to try and help answer these questions. You also can contact us if you would like to discuss this a little bit more in order to access some of the medical expertise we have at our site, you're most welcome to do so. I thank you for your time and attention and I look forward to hearing from you.